Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Chapter 5 of Pawn of Prophecy in our reading corner with Moose Changer Pat. Well, that's me, in case you're wondering. Let us begin. In mid-autumn that year, when the leaves had turned and the wind had showered them down from the trees like red and gold snow, when evenings were chill and the smoke from the chimneys at Falder's farm rose straight and blue toward the first cold stars in a purpling sky, Wolf returned. He came up the road one gusty afternoon under a lowering autumn sky with the new fallen leaves tumbling about him and his great dark cloak whipping in the wind. Garion, who had been dumping kitchen slops to the pigs, saw his approach and ran to meet him. The old man seemed travel-stained and tired, and his face under his gray hood was grim. His usual demeanor of happy-go-lucky cheerfulness had been replaced by a somber mood Garion had never seen him in before. Garion, Wolf said by way of greeting, you've grown, I see. It's been five years, Garion said. Has it been that long? Garion nodded, falling into step beside his friend. Is everyone well? Wolf asked. Oh yes, Garion said. Everything's the same here, except that Breldo got married and moved away, and the old brown cow died last summer. I remember that cow, Wolf said. Then he said, I must speak with your Aunt Paul. She's not in a very good mood today, Garion warned. It might be better if you rested in one of the barns. I can sneak some food and drink to you in a bit. We'll have to chance her mood, Wolf said. What I have to say to her can't wait. They entered the gate and crossed the courtyard to the kitchen door. Aunt Paul was waiting. You again, she said tartly, her hands on her hips. My kitchen still hasn't recovered from your last visit, Mistress Paul, Wolf said, bowing. Then he did a strange thing. His fingers traced an intricate little design in the air in front of his chest. Garion was quite sure that he was not intended to see those gestures. Aunt Paul's eyes widened slightly, then narrowed, and her face became grim. How do you... She started, then caught herself. Garion, she said sharply, I need some carrots. There are still some in the ground at the far end of the kitchen garden. Take a spade and pail and fetch me some. But, he protested, and then... Warned by her expression, he left quickly. He got a spade and pail from a nearby shed and then loitered near the kitchen door, eavesdropping, of course. Was not a nice habit and was considered the worst sort of bad manners in Sindaria. But Garion had long ago concluded that whenever he was sent away, the conversation was bound to be very interesting and would probably concern him rather intimately. He had wrestled briefly with his conscience about it, but since he really saw no harm in the practice, as long as he didn't repeat anything he heard, conscience had lost a curiosity. Garion's ears were very sharp, and it took him a moment or two to separate the two familiar voices from the other sounds in the kitchen. He won't leave you a trail, Aunt Paul was saying. He doesn't have to, Wolf replied. The thing itself will make its trail known to me. I can follow it as easily as a fox can scent out the track of a rabbit. Where will he take it? she asked. Who can say? His mind's closed to me. My guess is that he'll go north to Boktor. That's the shortest route to Garog, Nadrag. He'll know that I'll be after him, and he'll want to cross into the lands of the Angorax as soon as possible. His theft won't be complete so long as he stays in the west. When did it happen? Four weeks ago. He could already be in anger at kingdoms. That's not likely. The distances are great, but if he is, they'll have to follow him. I'll have to follow him. I'll need your help. But how can I leave here? Aunt Paul asked. I have to watch over the boy. Garion's curiosity was becoming almost unbearable. He edged closer to the kitchen door. The boy will be safe enough here, Wolf said. This is an urgent matter. No, Aunt Paul contradicted. Even this place isn't safe. Last Aristride, a Murgo and five Thulls came here. He posed as a merchant, but he asked a few too many questions about an old man and a boy named Rundering who had been in Upper Gralt some years ago. He may have recognized me. 
It's more serious than I thought then, Wolf said thoughtfully. We'll have to move the boy. We can leave him with friends elsewhere. No, Aunt Paul disagreed again. If I go with you, he'll have to go along. He's reaching an age where he has to be watched more carefully. Don't be foolish, Wolf said sharply. Garion was stunned. Nobody talked to Aunt Paul that way. It's my decision to make, Aunt Paul said crisply. We all agreed that he was to be in my care until he was grown. I won't go unless he goes with me. Garion's heart leaped. Paul, Wolf said sharply, think about where we may have to go. You can't deliver the boy into those hands. He'll be safer in Cathal Murgos or in Meloria itself than he would be here without me to watch him, Aunt Paul said. Last spring I caught him in the barn with a girl about his own age. As I said, he needs watching. Wolf laughed then, a rich merry sound. Is that all? He said, you worry too much about such things. How would you like it if we returned and found him married and about to become a father? Aunt Paul demanded acidly. He'd make an excellent farmer, and what matter if we'd all have to wait a hundred years for circumstances to be right again? Surely it hasn't gone that far. They're only children. You're blind, old wolf, Aunt Paul said. This is backcountry Sandari, and the boy's been raised to do the proper and honorable thing. The girl's a bright-eyed little minx who's maturing much too rapidly for my comfort. Right now, charming little Zubret is a far greater danger than any Murgo could ever be. Either the boy goes along, or I won't go either. You have your responsibilities, and I have mine. There's no time to argue, Wolf said. If it has to be this way, then so be it. Karen almost choked with excitement. He felt only passing momentary pang at leaving Zubret behind. He turned and looked exultedly up at the clouds scudding across the evening sky, and because his back was turned, he did not see Aunt Paul approach through the kitchen door. The garden, as I recall, lies beyond the south wall, she pointed out. Gary had started guiltily. How is it that the carrots remain undug? she demanded. I had to look for the spade, he said unconvincingly. Really? I see that you found it, however, her eyebrows arched dangerously. Only just now. Splendid. Carrots, Garion. Now. Garion grabbed his spade and pail and ran. It was just dusk when he returned and he saw Aunt Paul mounting the steps that led to Falder's quarters. He might have followed her to listen, but a faint movement in the dark doorway of one of the sheds made him step instead into one of the shadow of the gate. A furtive figure moved from the shed to the foot of the stairs. Aunt Paul had just climbed and silently crept up the stairs as soon as she went into Falder's door. The light was fading, and Garion could not see exactly who followed his aunt. He set down his pail, and grasping the spade like a weapon, he hurried quickly around the inner court, keeping to the shadows. There came the sound of a movement inside the chambers upstairs, and the figure at the door straightened quickly and scurried down the steps. Garion slipped back out of sight, and his spade still held at the ready. As the figure passed him, Garion briefly caught the scent of stale, musty clothing and rank sweat. As certainly as if he had seen the man's face, he knew that that figure that had followed his aunt had been Brill, the new farmhand. The door at the top of the stairs opened, and Garion heard his aunt's voice. I'm sorry, Falder, but it's a family matter, and I must leave immediately. I would pay you more, Paul. Falder's voice was almost breaking. Money has nothing to do with it, Aunt Paul replied. You're a good man, Falder, and your farm has been a haven to me when I needed one. I'm grateful to you, more than you can know, but I must leave. Perhaps when this family business is over you can come back, Falder almost pleaded. No, Falder, she said. I'm afraid not. We'll miss you, Paul, Falder said with tears in his voice. And I'll miss you, dear Falder. I've never met a better-hearted man. I'd take it kindly if you wouldn't mention my leaving until I've gone. I'm not fond of explanations or sentimental goodbyes.
Whatever you wish, Paul. Don't look so mournful, old friend, Aunt Paul said lightly. My helpers are well trained. Their cooking will be the same as mine. Your stomach will never know the difference. My heart will, Falder said. Don't be silly, she said gently. Now I must see to supper. Garion moved quickly away from the foot of the stairs. Troubled, he put his spade back in the shed and fetched the pail of carrots he had left sitting by the gate to reveal to his aunt that he had seen Brill listening at the door would immediately raise questions about his own activities that he would prefer not to have to answer. In all probability, Brill was merely curious, and there was nothing menacing or ominous about that. To observe the unsavory Brill duplicating his own seemingly harmless pastime, however, made Garion quite uncomfortable, even slightly ashamed of himself. Although Garion was much too excited to eat, supper that evening seemed as ordinary as any meal on Fowler's farm had ever been. Garion con covertly watched sour-faced Brill, but the man showed no outward sign of having in any way been changed by the conversation he had gone to so much trouble to overhear. When supper was over, as was always the case when he visited the farm, Mr. Wolf was prevailed upon to tell a story. He rose and stood for a moment deep in thought, as the wind moaned in the chimney and the torches flickered in their rings on the pillars in the hall. As all men know, he began, the Marags are no more, and the spirit of Mara weeps alone in the wilderness and wails among the moss-grown ruins of Maragor. But also, as all men know, the hills and streams of Maragor are heavy with fine yellow gold. That gold, of course, was the cause of the destruction of the Marags. When a certain neighboring kingdom became aware of the gold, the temptation became too great, and the result, as it always seemed, is when gold at the issue between kingdoms was war. The protext for the war was the lamentable fact that the Marags were cannibals. While this habit is distasteful to civilized men, had there not been gold in Maragor, it might have been overlooked. The war, however, was inevitable, and the Marags were slain, but the spirit of Mara and the ghosts of all the slaughtered Marags remained in Maragor, as those who went into the haunted kingdom soon discovered. Now it chanced to happen that about that time there lived in the town of Muros in southern St. Daria, three adventuresome men, and hearing of all that gold, they resolved to journey down to Maragor to claim their share of it. The men, as I said, were adventuresome and bold, and they scoffed at the tales of ghosts. Their journey was long, for it, it is many hundreds of leagues from Muros to the upper reaches of Maragor, but the smell of the gold drew them on, and so it happened one dark and stormy night that they crept across the border into Maragor, past the patrols which had been set to turn back just as they. That nearby kingdom, having gone to all the expense and inconvenience of war, was quite naturally reluctant to share the gold with anyone who chanced to pass by. Through the night they crept, burning with their lust for gold. The spirit of Mara wailed about them, but they were brave men and not afraid of spirits. And besides, they told each other, the sound was not truly a spirit, but merely the moaning of the wind in the trees. As dim and misty morning seeped amongst the hills, they could hear, not far away, the rushing sound of a river. As all men know, gold is most easily found among the banks of rivers. And so they made quickly toward the sound. Then one of them chanced to look down in the dim light, and behold, the ground at his feet were strewn with gold, lumps and chunks of it. Overcome with greed, he remained silent and loitered behind until his companions were out of sight. Then he fell to his knees and began to gather up gold as a child might pick flowers. He heard a sound behind him, and he turned, and he saw it. It is best not to say, dropping all his gold, he bolted. Now the river they had heard cut through a gorge just about there, 
and his two companions were amazed to see him run off the edge of that gorge and even continue to run as he fell, his legs churning insubstantial air. Then they turned and they saw what had been pursuing him. One went quite mad and leaped with a despairing cry into the same gorge which had just claimed his companion. But the third adventure, the bravest and boldest of all, stood himself that no ghost could actually hurt a living man and stood his ground. That, of course, was the worst mistake of all. The ghost circled him as he stood bravely, certain that they could not hurt him. Mr. Wolf paused and drank brief, briefly from his tankard. And then the old story teller continued, because even ghosts can become hungry. They divided him up and ate him. Garion's hair stood on end at the shocking conclusion of Wolf's tale, and he could sense the others at the table shuddering. It was not at all the kind of story they had expected to hear. Dernick the smith, who was sitting nearby, had a perplexed expression on his plain face. Finally, he spoke. I would not question the truth of your story for the world, he said to Wolf, struggling with the words. But if they ate him, the ghosts, I mean, where did it go? I mean, if ghosts are insubstantial, and all men say they are, they don't have stomachs, do they? And what would they bite with? Wolf's face grew sly and mysterious. He raised one finger as if he were almost about to make some cryptic reply to Dernig's puzzled question. And then he suddenly began to laugh. Dernick looked annoyed at first, and then, rather sheepishly, he too began to laugh. Slowly the laughter spread as they all began to understand the joke. An excellent jest, old friend, Falder said, laughing as hard as any of the others, and one from which m much instruction may be gained. Greed is bad, but fear is worse, and the world is dangerous enough without cluttering it with Im imaginary hobgoblins. Trust Falder to twist a good story into a moralistic sermon of some kind. True enough, good Falder, Wolf said most seriously, but there are things in this world which can't be explained away or dismissed with laughter. Brill, seated near the fire, had not joined in the laughter. I've never seen a ghost, he said sourly nor ever met any one who has, and I, for one, don't believe in any kind of magic or sorcery or such childishness. And he stood up and stamped out of the hall, almost as if the story had been a kind of personal insult. Later in the kitchen, when Aunt Paul was seeing to the cleaning up, and Wolf lounged against one of the work tables with a tankard of beer, Garion's struggle with his conscience finally came into the open. That dry interior voice informed him most pointedly that concealing what he had seen was not merely foolish, but possibly dangerous as well. He set down the pot he was scrubbing and crossed to where they were. It might not be important, he said carefully, but this afternoon when I was coming back from the garden, I saw Brill following you, Aunt Paul. She turned and looked at him. Wolf set down his tankard. Go on, Garion, Aunt Paul said. It was when you went up to talk with Falder, Garion explained. He waited until you'd gone up the stairs and Falder had let you in. Then he sneaked up and listened at the door. I saw him up there when I went to put the spade away. How long has this man Brill been at the farm? Wolf asked, frowning. He came just last spring, Garion said, after Breldo got married and moved away. And the Murgo merchant was here at Aristride some months before? Aunt Paul looked at him sharply. You think? She did not finish. I think it might not be a bad idea if I stepped around and had a few words with friend Brill, Wolf said grimly. Do you know where his room is, Garion? Garion nodded, his heart suddenly racing. Show me. Wolf moved away from the table against which he had been lounging and his step was no longer the step of an old man. It was curiously as if the years had suddenly dropped away from him. Be careful, Aunt Paul warned. Wolf chuckled, and the sound was chilling. I'm always careful. 
You should know that by now. Garion quickly led Wolf out into the yard and around to the far end where the steps mounted to the gallery that led to the rooms of the farm hands. They went up, their soft leather shoes making no sound on the worn steps. Down here, Garion whispered, not exactly knowing why he whispered. Wolf nodded, and they went quietly into the dark gallery. Here, Garion whispered, stopping. Step back, Wolf breathed. His t he touched the door with his fingertips. Is it locked? Garion asked. That's no problem, Wolf said softly. He put his hand to the latch. There was a click, and the door swung open. Wolf stepped inside with Garion close behind. It was totally dark in the room. The sour stink of Brill's unwashed clothes were in the air. He's not here, Wolf said in a normal tone. He fumbled with something at his belt, and there was the scrape of flint against steel and a flare of sparks. A wisp of frayed rope caught the sparks and began to glow. Wolf blew on the spark for a second, and it flared into flame. He raised the burning wisp over his head and looked around the empty room. The floor and bed were littered with rumpled clothes and personal belongings. Gary knew instantly that this was not simple untidiness, but rather was the sign of hasty departure, and he did not know exactly how it was that he knew. Wolf stood for a moment, holding his little torch, his face seeming un somehow empty, as if his mind were searching for something. The stables, he said sharply. Quickly, boy! Garion turned and dashed from the room with Wolf close behind. The burning wisp of rope drifted down into the yard, illuminated it briefly after Wolf discarded it over the railing as he ran. There was a light in the stable. It was dim, partially covered, but faint beams shone through the weathered cracks in the door. The horses were stirring uneasily. Stay clear, boy! Wolf said as he jerked the stable door open. Brill was inside, struggling to saddle a horse that shied from his rank smell. Leaving Brill? Wolf asked, stepping into the doorway with his arms crossed. Brill turned quickly, crouched, and with a snarl on his unshaven face, his off-center eye gleamed whitely in the half-muffled light of the lantern hanging from a peg on one of the stalls, and his broken teeth shone bright behind his pulled back lips a strange time for a journey wolf said dryly don't interfere with me old man brill said his tone menacing you'll regret it i've regretted many things in my life wolf said i doubt that one more is going to make all that much difference i warned you brill snarled and his hand dove under his cloak and emerged with a short rust blotched sword don't be stupid, Wolf said in a tone of overwhelming contempt. Garion, however, at the first flash of the sword, whipped his hand into his belt, drew his dagger, and stepped in front of the unarmed old man. Get back, boy, Wolf barked. But Garion had already lunged forward, his bright dagger thrust out ahead of him. Later, when he had time to consider, he could not have explained why he reacted as he did. Some deep instinct seemed to take over. Garion, Wolf said, get out of the way! So much the better, Brill said, raising his sword. And then Dernick was there. He appeared as if from nowhere, snatched up on an ox yoke, and struck the sword from Brill's hand. Brill turned on him, enraged, and Dernick's second blow took the cast-eyed man in the ribs, a little below the armpit. The breath whooshed from Brill's lungs, and he collapsed, gasping and writhing to the straw-littered floor. For shame, Garion, Dernick said reproachfully. I didn't make that knife of yours for this kind of thing. He was going to kill Mr. Wolf, Garion protested. Never mind that, Wolf said, bending over the gasping man on the floor of the stable. He searched Brill roughly and pulled a jingling purse out from under the stained tunic. He carried the purse to the lantern and opened it. That's mine, Brill gasped, trying to rise. Dernick raised the ox yoke, but Brill sank back again. A sizable sum for an ordinary farmhand to have, friend Brill, Wolf said, pouring the jingling coins from the purse into his hand. How did you manage to come by it? Brill glared at him. Garion's eyes grew wide 
at the sight of the coins. He had never seen gold before. You don't really need to answer, friend Brill, Wolf said, examining one of the coins. Your gold speaks for you. He dumped the coins back in the purse and tossed the small leather pouch back to the man on the floor. Brill grabbed it quickly and pushed it back inside his tunic. I'll have to tell Falder of this, Dernick said. No, Wolf said. It's a serious matter, Dernick said. A bit of wrestling or a few blows exchanged is one thing, but drawing weapons is quite another. There's no time for all that, Wolf said, taking a piece of harness strapped from a peg on the wall. Tie his hands behind him, and we'll put him in one of the grain bins. Someone will find him in the morning. Dernick stared at him. Trust me, good Dernick, Wolf said. The matter's urgent. Tie him up and hide him someplace. Then come to the kitchen. Come with me, Garion. And he turned and left the stable. Aunt Paul was pacing her kitchen nervously when they returned. Well, she demanded. He was trying to leave, Wolf said. We stopped him. Did you... She left it hanging. No. He drew a sword, but Dernick happened to be nearby and knocked the belligerence out of him. The intervention was timely. Your cub here was about to do battle. That little dagger of his is a pretty thing, but not really much of a match for a sword. Aunt Paul turned on Gary and her eyes ablaze. Garion prudently stepped back out of reach. There's no time for that, Wolf said, retrieving the tankard he had set down before leaving the kitchen. Brill had a patch, pouch full of good red Angorak gold. The Murgos have set eyes to watching this place. I'd wanted to make our going less noticeable, but since we're already being watched, there's no point in that now. Gather what you and the boy are likely to need. I want a few leagues between us and Brill before he manages to free himself. I don't want to be looking over my shoulder for Murgos every place I go. Dernick, who had come into the kitchen, stopped and stood staring at them. Things aren't what they seem here, he said. What manner of folk are you, and how is it that you have such dangerous enemies? That's a long story, good Dernick, Wolf said. But I'm afraid there's no time to tell it now. Make our apologies to Falder, and see if you can't detain Brail, Brill for a day or two. I'd like our trail to be quite cold before he or his friends try to find it. Someone else is going to have to do that, Dernick said slowly. I'm not sure what this is all about, but I'm sure that there's danger involved in it. It appears that I'll have to go with you, at least until I've gotten you safely away from here. Aunt Paul suddenly laughed. You, Dernick? You mean to protect us? He drew himself up. I'm sorry, Mistress Paul, he said. I will not permit you to go unescorted. Will not permit? She said incredulously. Very well, Wolf said, a sly look on his face. Have you totally taken leave of your senses? Aunt Paul demanded, turning on him. Dernick's shown himself to be a useful man, Wolf said. If nothing else, he'll give me someone to talk with along the way. Your tongue's grown sharper with the years, Paul, and I don't relish the idea of a hundred leagues or more with nothing but abuse for companionship. I see that you finally slipped into your dotage, old wolf, she said acidly. That's exactly the sort of thing I meant, Wolf replied blandly. Now gather a few ne necessary things and let's be away from here. The night's passing rapidly. She glared at him for a moment and then stormed out of the kitchen. I'll have to fetch some things too, Dernick said. He turned and went in out into the gusty night. Garion's mind whirled. Things were happening far too fast. Afraid, boy? Wolf asked. Well, Garion said, it's just that I don't understand. I don't understand any of this at all. You will in time, Garion, Wolf said. For now, it's better perhaps that you don't. There's danger in what we're doing, but not all that great a danger. Your aunt and I, and good Dernick, of course, will see that no harm comes to you. Now help me in the pantry. He took a lantern into the pantry and began loading some loaves of bread, a ham, a round yellow cheese, and several bottles of wine into a sack which he took down from a peg. It was nearly midnight, as closely as Garion could tell, when they quietly left the kitchen and crossed the dark courtyard. The faint creak of the gate as Dernick swung it open seemingly 
seemed enormously loud. As they passed through the gate, Garion felt a momentary pang. Father's farm had been the only home he had ever known. He was leaving now, perhaps forever, and such things had great significance. He felt an even sharper pang at the memory of Zubret. The thought of Darun and Zubret together in the hay barn almost made him want to give the whole thing up altogether, but it was far too late now. Beyond the protection of the buildings, the gusty wind was chill and whipped at Garion's cloak. Heavy clouds covered the moon, and the road seemed only slightly less dark than the surrounding fields. It was cold and lonely, and more than a little frightening. He walked a bit closer to Aunt Paul. At the top of the hill, he stopped and glanced back. Falder's farm was only a pale, dim blur in the valley behind. Regretfully, he turned his back on it. The valley ahead was very dark, and even the road was lost in the gloom before them. <laughs>